Been at Church of the Highlands now for five years. 13 years. Three and a half years. Three or four months now. Three and a half years. Four years. A year and a half now. 11 years. Six years. Uh, seven or eight years. I stopped keeping up with I'm just having fun. 12 years. Seven years. 19, 20 years. Five years. Six years. 21 years. My wife. Sister-in-law. My mom. A colleague. My boss. Friends. A great friend of mine. A very dear friend. The Dream Center. A roommate. My son. My wife got invited to a freedom group. I first heard about Highlands in prison. Uh, Highlands came to our prison every Sunday. I met Pastor Chris and Miss Tammy, uh, and they invited me to church. I just randomly looked up, like, churches that have an evening service on Easter. My kids were at Auburn University, and we would go down on Saturdays to watch football games. And Sunday morning, they had us at church in Auburn, and that was my first experience with Highlands. And I'm a Bama fan, too, you know? <laughs> I remember walking in, and uh, we had just been hungry for something, and we didn't know what it was. We were just looking for more. I just felt like the Lord was just calling us to do, do more. You couldn't get two steps without them greeting you and so enthusiastic and so happy to see you. I've never been anywhere with a joy and the enthusiasm and the worship was just so strong. There's just a contagious joy that you feel when you come here. I sat down and I just started to cry because I knew I was home. And I knew in that moment that we were home. You never feel like an outcast in Highlands. You always feel like you're at home. I never had a church family and here I have a family, a God loving family. Highlands has changed my life forever. Radically changed my life. It's changed our lives for the better. My life is totally different than when I came in. When I started here, it catapulted me to a place that I felt like I didn't even know. Highlands has been so great to me, and God has been even greater just by placing me in this place. I can't even believe the life that I live now compared to who I was before I knew God, and I, I don't ever want that life back. This place is awesome. I just thank God that we're here where we, where we belong. Come on, give God praise for that. Come on, give God a great praise for that, everybody. It's awesome. All right. Well, happy anniversary, Highlands, and also welcome to week number one of a five-part series uh, that we're calling ER. And the ER does not stand for what you think it stands for. Let me get to that in just a second. But let me look straight into the camera and say hello to all of our campuses, our locations, all across Alabama and into Columbus, Georgia. And today we're adding our second location in Georgia, everybody, that we're excited for you to celebrate. So let's give our hand clap today to the newest campus. Wait, wait, wait. The newest campus at Church of the Highlands in Noonan, Georgia. Come on, everybody. <laughs> That's awesome. So if you want to know the story of this location, uh, they've actually been with us for almost nine years now, watching uh, our, our Summit Church, watching our, our services. I've been preaching there for nine years, and their board got together and just said, look, would you just please adopt us? Let us be a part of the Highlands family, and we're so delighted to now call them Church of the Highlands, noon in Georgia, and we're so glad you're along for the ride. Of course, to the men and women in the Alabama Department of Corrections, we're always delighted that you're with us as well, and for those watching online somewhere. Today, we are beginning a brand new series called uh, Extraordinary Relationships. And the reason why we're calling it Extraordinary is because we're trying to bring everybody up to the place where God has for us in our lives. And so this is kind of the season where we're talking about relationships a lot. Before I dive into the Word, let me remind you that in the middle of this series that we also have our annual marriage conference. So if you're engaged or married, we're inviting you to register for this conference and attend it. It's a Friday night, spectacular experience. And then afterwards, we have this date night experience that you're not wanting to miss. And then it's about a half day on Saturday. And, and for some of you, because you're so new to our church, we would wanna let you know that uh, there is a fee for this, but if you don't have it, just let us know. We always build in scholarships and would love for those people to come anyway. We never want money to be the reason why you didn't attend something here at Church of the Highlands. So be sure to still register anyway. We'll be glad to help you out uh, in that way. So we're calling this Extraordinary Relationships. We realize that relationships are very, very tough. And even in the last few years, for a lot of us, it, um, the, 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 the pressures and the stress and the crisis of our world around us has taken its toll on relationships, and many are in need of ER. You're, you're in need of critical care. 
Um, but, but the ER doesn't just stand for emergency room, which is where a lot of us are right now. We believe it literally does stand for extraordinary relationships. And when I first brought this idea to our creative team, so that's the process we go through. I bring these sermon series ideas to a team and they help work it out and bring all the creative aspects to it. They all actually, almost to a person said, um, we need to name it something else other than extraordinary. And I said, why? And they said, that's just too high of a bar. People aren't gonna be able to go there um, they're not at that place anymore to call anything in their life extraordinary. Uh, they want to more like get it just a little above everybody else, kind of survival. And I thought, no, I actually argued with my own team. I said, no, that's the whole problem is that we've actually, actually lowered the bar in the expectation of what God can do in our lives. And the word extraordinary doesn't mean you're better than everybody else. It just means you're extra ordinary. Your option is just to be ordinary. And ordinary is not working. Can I hear a better amen, everybody? And I'm asking you to come to a place, and it begins by faith and setting your own expectation of your faith to what God can do in your life. So I want you to do that. And here's our theme verse out of Romans chapter 12. It says, don't become so well adjusted to your culture that actually now you're fitting into that culture. You're looking like culture. You're ordinary like everyone else without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God and you let me take you on that journey. I promise you this will work. You'll be changed and watch how from the inside out. So that's not how you want it. <laughs> you want it outside in. You want like, make, make her nice. Make him like show up. Like, you know, you want... We want different things externally, but they all happen first internally. Readily recognize, the Bible says, what he wants from you, God wants from you, and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, this is your option, that will drag you down to its level of immaturity. God wants to bring out the best of you. So this is in, every, in your temperament, in your attitude, in your marriage, your communication, your conflict resolution, even your intimacy. God wants to bring the best out of you, developing well-formed maturity in all of us. And this is God's plan. I just want you to hear it and know that it's actually possible if you'll take the journey that God has for you. And I wanna begin a place, since we kinda have this medical theme, this ER theme, I wanna begin with a medical kind of a thought that's actually more spiritual than it is physical. And that is just like in the natural, the thing that your whole life is centered around is your heart. So the condition of your heart's gonna de determine the condition of your life, and it's one of the few organs in your body that you absolutely cannot live without. So you can live without some other parts of your body, even some of your organs, you can live without them, but you can't live without the heart. The heart stops, you're dead. And so we have cardiovascular disease in the natural, still, by the way, is the number one killer uh, in, in, in the world is cardiovascular disease. We also have a spiritual cardiovascular disease going on. In other words, a lot of what we don't like is coming out of the condition of our hearts. I want to talk about it a little bit in a message that I've t entitled, A Matter of the Heart. Now, just to give you a little bit of a theological background, and we're going to dive kind of more deep into the scriptures today, so if you like it deep, you like a lot of, like a more deeper teaching, you're gonna, I think you're going to love today. Proverbs 4 says, above all else, you got to guard your heart, for out of it flow the wellspring, or the, one translation says, out of your heart is flowing all of your, the issues of your life. So you don't realize that, but it actually is. And that's why Jesus, when he came along and he taught, he was trying to get Christianity or religion or faith in God away from all things external. By the way, if you ever wanted an easy understanding of Old Testament versus New Testament, here is just one explanation, and that the Old Testament was very external. So the laws were external, the obedience was external, and they never focused really on what was going on the inside of you. The New Testament comes along and says, no, 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 it's the inside that's determining the outside. So when Jesus said things like, he would say things like this, you have heard it said, do not commit adultery. So that's an external behavior that we want to, you know, follow. He says, but I tell you, if you have lust in your heart, you're already in the process of adultery. Like it's stemming from your adultery is not happening because you're undisciplined. Your adultery is happening because you have lust going on inside of the heart. You take care of the heart, it'll take care of all of that. And he kept talking about things like this. Even when he was asked about divorce and marriage and remarriage, Jesus addressed these. But notice again, the Pharisees came to Jesus. They, tried, they were trying to trick him. They didn't have a pure motive. They were trying to trap him with the question. 
Should a man be allowed to divorce his wife for just any reason? And then Jesus said, he referred to the Old Testament, haven't you read what the scriptures say? They record that from the beginning, God made them male and female. And by the way, let me just note right there, I know the world's completely confused about whether it can be a male or a female or many more. God's not unclear. I just wanted to kind of point that out right there. Okay. All right. And he said, this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. And since they are no longer two but one, let no one split apart what God has joined together. And then they came back with a follow-up question. Okay, that's fine. But then why did Moses say in the law that a man could give his wife a written notice of divorce and send her away? So if, it's, if, it, if this is not what you wanted, why is it still permitted in the law? And watch what Jesus says. It's very interesting. And that is Jesus, Moses permitted divorce only as a concession to the fact that it all really began with a hard heart. But it was not what God had originally intended. So if any time we have something in our life that God didn't originally intend, you have two choices. You can just try to be either miserable and make yourself just try to do better, or you can address the condition of your heart. And that's what God wants us to do. In fact, I want to show, here's where the deeper part comes. The heart issue is so huge that in the Old Testament, whenever they had the priest put on certain garments... One of the things that the priest would put on was called this breast piece of decision. And I want you to see what it says. And by the way, you're thinking, well, man, that was priest. No, no, no. In the New Testament, we are a kingdom of priests. So this is for you and me today. Can I hear a better amen, everybody? Are y'all out there? Okay, now watch this. Whenever a priest comes to God, enters into the holy place, he's already bearing names, names over the heart. You say, I'm time out right there. Let me explain this to you. So every time you come to God, every one of you, when you come to God, you're, you're, you're bearing something that's been written on your life. All of us. Let me say it this way. We are all the sum total of everything that's happened to us up to this point. And all of that is in the heart. So that's why we can all see the same thing right now and all see it differently. Because it's going through, our eyes and our life is going through a filter of our experiences. I call it our pain, past, problems, and people. And we all, all have that. And, they, and so the Bible calls them names. And they're written over your heart. And watch this. And the names over your heart are the breast piece of decision. In other words, it says it this way. You will always bear the means of making decision by that which is written on your heart. So your decisions are coming from what's right there. Now, we all have a set of good stuff, and we all have a set of bad stuff. The question is, what are you putting your life filter through? And if you're putting it through an unhealed, unforgiving, unrepentant, unredeemed heart, well, then you're saying, well, why do I keep acting like this? Why am I so mad? Why does this bother me so much? It's because you're putting it through a filter of things that have been written over your heart. And that's one of the most important steps in your spiritual journey is to let that heart get healed. So you can go to heaven without it getting healed. You're just going to be miserable along the way. In fact, there's absolutely no way to improve your relationships, your marriage, your kids, your life, your addictions, your habits, your choices without first addressing what's going on with the heart. Are y'all following me, everybody? And we all have it. We all have it. Every single one of us. Let me tell you a story about my wife's dad, Billy Hornsby. Now, he's in heaven now. Unfortunately, he died at very young, 61 years old. He had a little melanoma tumor on the bottom of his foot, never exposed to the sun, um, and, and he had four doctors telling him it was nothing, don't worry about it, until he was already, I was, it was all throughout his body, and once they discovered it, he lived another year and a half, 61 years old, he went to be with the Lord. He was my best friend in the whole wide world. Uh, we talked on the phone every day of our lives, every day, without fail, every day for 27 years, from the time I knew him, and in fact, I knew him before I knew my wife. Yeah, he was a missionary in Germany, uh, was pastor in Louisiana at first. And, and, uh, and I, when I was a youth pastor, we always did a bunch of missions trips. Well, most of my trips were over to where he was uh, in West Germany. And, uh, and we were very, very close. And he was back home from one of those trips. And he called me, said, hey, I want to take you out to Phil's Oyster Bar on Government Street in Baton Rouge. 
I'm like, I am in. Sounds so great. And um, we got us a big old shrimp and osher poi bite. Can I hear a good amen, everybody? It was just del- delicious. And as I was chomping down on this wonderful seafood po' boy, he looked across the table and he said, have you considered my, my daughter Tammy? And I said, I can't say that I have. And um, <laughs> he said, well, I'd like you to take her out. And I always tell people, Billy proposed to me right there uh, at Phil's <laughs> Oyster Boy. And so I took Tammy out and we developed a relationship and of course, um, uh, we got married, and, 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 and we miss Billy very, very, very much. Um, but when Billy tells his story that when he was in eighth grade, um, he was called on by the math teacher to uh, do a problem on the boards. You know how teachers will do that sometimes. They'll, they'll like put a problem on the chalkboard and like pick somebody out. They have to walk up and kind of do it in front of everybody. Well, that was, it was his turn. And so this teacher put the problem on the, on the chalkboard. He said, hey, Hornsby. And this is a, kind of a tough math teacher. Was, he also uh, was a coach uh, in the school, so he had two different jobs. It's kind of a tough male. Hey, hey Hornsby, come figure out, do it. come do this problem. Well, Billy was a genius. And when I say genius, like a real genius, very, very smart. And when he, when he, as he walked out of his little desk and he was, as he's walking up to the chalkboard, he, go, he goes ahead and he solves the, the math problem in his mind. So when he got up there to this board, he just threw, drew a line, put the answer, turned around, and went back to his seat. And the teacher said, hey, Hornsby, that's wrong. He goes, no, it's not. It's right. He goes, well, I know the answer's right, but you didn't show your work. Didn't you hate that, everybody? I always hated that part. You didn't show your work, so it's wrong. He goes, well, it doesn't matter. I got the answer right. And he shouldn't have been that sassy to the teacher. Um, but it made him so mad. And the teacher pointed his finger at Billy and says, Hornsby, you'll never amount to anything. And that day, for whatever reason, that phrase got written over Billy's heart. So he kept going back physically to school, but never went back mentally or emotionally and started failing everything. Remember, he's a genius and he can't get along with anybody and he's going down. So he was so desperate knowing that he would never graduate, never have that he, he actually snuck out of the house as a 15-year-old. Imagine this, parents. Snuck out almost every night and played country music in bars, and that's how he made his money as a 15-year-old. Bumming rides on the street and just playing country music. He could play 300 songs, country music songs, with, without any notes. I mean, he was a, he had a, again, he had a brilliant mind. He's a great musician as well. And so by age 17, he actually ended up getting his girlfriend uh, since 13, pregnant. Her name was Charlene, my mother-in-law. And they got pregnant at 17 years old, unmarried. And by the way, that pregnancy was your first lady. It was Miss Tammy. And I, we tell that, and Tammy says, tell them, tell them this story to show the redemption of God in a person's life. Come on, somebody, right? And when they realized that they were pregnant, they went ahead and got married at 17 years old. In fact, he jokingly said later in his life, he goes, man, we, we knew each other for four years and got, we waited till 17 to get married. So I just tell the kids they need to wait, you know? So anyway, uh, yeah, <laughs> we did, you know, so no, you didn't. Uh, but anyway, uh, but they still weren't Christians and he had no way of making money at all because he's, again, he's uneducated, no, didn't have a degree. Now he has a little family and he's you know, now 18 years old. So he did what most everybody does in Baton Rouge and that is about a third of the population work at one of the chemical refineries along the Mississippi. So he went and got a job at, at Exxon, and he had the lowest paying job at Exxon and wasn't enough. And so he says, man, I've got to figure out how to get promoted into the system. So he, he asked that he could take a test to receive a promotion. And, he, and remember, on, on his heart is, you'll never amount to anything. So when he filled it out, he knew he'd gotten the whole thing wrong, turned it in, and the examiner called him back that afternoon and said, Mr. Hornsby, I need you to come in and let's talk about uh, this test. And Billy said, because he had written over his heart, you'll never amount to anything. Why make me come back just to tell me I failed? Just tell me I failed. And they said, sir, would you please just come in and let us talk to you about this? And so he drove back to Exxon, went into the examiner's office, and the examiner said, Mr. Hornsby, we've never had somebody score this high on this test. And he had no idea about the eighth grade story. Only God could do this. And he said, hey, if you'll put your mind to it, you'll really amount to something someday. And the curse was reversed. And that moment, watch this, don't miss this. That other name got erased. You'll never amount to anything. 
to you'll really amount to something. He would go on to plant churches all over Europe, and he was one of the six founders of ARC that now has planted 1,100 churches all across America. He was a genius in every way and one of those beautiful people I know, but that's the power of a name written over your heart. Now listen to me, you are operating, every one of you, myself included, are operating out of something good or bad that has happened over us and it's written there, whether you know it or not. And for some of you, the name is an actual name of a person that you remember, that's, it marked you, good or bad, it marked you. And then others of you, it's experiences that good or bad has marked you and your life is going through this filter and what God wants you to do before we get into communication and conflict and our sexual intimacy and all the things that are related to making all things relationships work, you better start with what's going on here or nothing will work. So I'll show you in another place in the Old Testament, one of my favorite stories that you probably have never heard about. In fact, the guy we're gonna talk about, you probably never heard his name. Now his son is very famous. His son is Abraham, but the Bible says this is the account of Terah. Terah became the father of three boys, Abram, Nahor, and Haran, or some say Haran. And Haran, or Haran, became the father of Lot. And while his father, Terah, was still alive, Haran, the baby in the family, is now dead. So we don't know how Haran died. All we do know is it was premature because daddy's still alive. All right, so it can only be one of two things, either by disease or by accident, Haran's gone. And it even notice, it mentions where this happens. It happened in Ur of the Chaldeans. Now, Ur is gonna represent the place that God does not want you to be, but it's where you're stuck in. That's why they call it Ur. Okay, so that's why it's called that, all right? So just letting you know, that's all Hebrew, I'm sure, somewhere. Anyway, all right. But all of a sudden, I want you to notice this, this event that takes place. And I am gonna infer something that may not be true, but I think it is. So you can spit this out if you don't like it. But Tara all of a sudden wakes up one day and decides, I gotta get out of Ur. And I'm gonna go to this place, um, this new place, and it ends up telling us where that place is, and it's gonna be Canaan, which ends up being the promised land. Now, the only thing that's missing in this story that I am inferring that you don't have to agree with is that I believe God called him to it. I think God woke him up and said, take your son Abram his, and the grandson Lot, son of Haran, and your daughter-in-law Sarai and the wife of Abram, and I need you to together set out from Ur to, to, to the Chaldeans, and I need you to go what was end up gonna be the promised land. And I'm gonna make this statement, and it might not be true, but I think it is, that the original call wasn't on Abraham's life, it was on his daddy. And that all along, it was, God was supposed to be the God of Terah, Abraham, and Isaac, not Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's just my thought. You don't have to believe it. All I know is, is that happened, and he was supposed to be the God to go to Canaan, but then you get one of the most depressing verses in the Bible, because when they came to Haran, what do you mean they came to Haran? I thought he's dead. No, this is the name of a city that is between Ur and Promised Land, he had to pass through the name of a city called Haran that just so happened to be the same name as the dead baby boy. And when he got there, he couldn't get over his pain. And he settled there. But that's not where he was supposed to go. Remember, he's going to Canaan, but he doesn't go to Canaan. Terah lived 205 years and dies in Haran. And I've been doing this 40 years and I've watched people try to, I try to lead them out of their Ur to their promised land and they get to their pain and they never move beyond it. And they settle there. Is why? It's because you get stuck on a problem, a pain. For him, it was the death of a baby boy that probably was so traumatic for him and rightfully so, but it made him stuck in a place where he never got to God's best and so he ended up the rest of his life ordinary when God had called him to something extraordinary. I don't know about you, but I'm preaching just a little bit here in the 1130 service. And by the way, the next verse is chapter 12, verse one, where God told Abraham, hey, would you leave? Could, will you be the one? Could, I need you to go. To, if your daddy wouldn't do it, I need you to go. And, God, and, and you go read it. It's the calling of Abraham. Why? Because of a name. In his case, it was Haran. And there's something in all of us. You think, no, my daddy was mean. My, my granddaddy was mean. My, my great great daddy was mean. We just, I'm just mean. No, it's not. It's, just, it's in the genetics. No, it's not. It's in the heart. It's in the heart. So I'll show you one more place. Um, and I love studying this because it shows 
Not how, not how desperately God wants to write names, good names over your heart, but also how the devil wants to write bad names over your heart. And it's all throughout the scriptures. I could show you many places. In fact, if you'll just recall, for those of you who've been in church, pretty much every time God does something in a person's life, he changes their, their name. It happens all the time. But I've actually written a book on the life of Daniel. It's one of my favorite Bible characters in the Bible. And if you don't know this story, this is a period of time where God just took his hands off of Israel and said, y'all rejected me enough. And, and because God removed his hand off their life, the Babylonians, which is modern day Iraq, went in and ripped apart, besieged their city, Jerusalem, and took all the inhabitants of Jerusalem over to Iraq as slaves. It's called the Babylonian captivity or the Babylonian exile. But watch what happens when they get there. The king ordered this devil of a guy named Ashpenaz, who was the chief of his court officials, hey, go pick out some of those Hebrews, some of those Israelites um, from the royal family and nobility, and we're not gonna treat them like common slaves. We're gonna bring them into my court. They're gonna serve me. Find me some young men, which is, by the way, when most of our names get written which is why you see the, the attack of the devil on our college campuses and among our college students. And I'm telling you, there's an all-out assault right now against young people to indoctrinate them into something that is so far away from God. And if we don't wake up, we're going to miss the fact that they have, been, have names written over their heart that they will have to carry for the rest of their lives. Are y'all following me, everybody? This is really happening. So find me some that don't have any physical defect, that are handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, qualified to serve, and teach them, indoctrinate them into Babylonian culture, Babylonian language, Babylonian literature. Let's, let's, let's change them. Let's change them. And so he chose four, Daniel, and you don't even recognize these next three names, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah. You don't recognize those because those are their Hebrew names. In fact, most of us know their new Babylonian names. And that's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Or if you're a veggie tail person, Rack, Shack, and Benny. All right, everybody, you got it? Okay. <laughs> but what you don't know is what those names mean, and I've done the work for you. Because Daniel's original Hebrew name meant, I'm going to live by the judgment statutes the plan of God. God's right, not me. God is my judge. And it changed his new names. His new Babylonian name was Belteshazzar, which was a feminine name. And it was Lady, protect the king. This is happening in society right now where they're, they're saying, no, 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 that's not who you are. You're this. They're, they're, it's a confused identity. And we have a generation that is confused in who they are. And by the way, the world's answer to that is gender affirming care, they call it, which I think is ridiculous. In fact, we don't need to mutilate people's bodies. We need to tell them who God's made them to be, everybody. That's what. To Hanani Hananiah's name means Yahweh is the, like God is awesome. He's gracious, he's good, to Shadrach, which means you, could, you're, you need to be afraid of God. He's, he's mean. He's not for you, he's against you. You mess up one time, he'll, he'll make you a grease spot. And it's a distorted spirituality. And there are people all over. By the way, this is changing right before our eyes. There's more hunger for God right now in America than there has been in the last 20 or 30 years. And it's all been documented. There's something happening. But for 20 or 30 years, people have seen God as something. You don't want to serve God. Your life will be reduced down to so much boredom. He's no fun. He's not, that's not worth, that's not, nothing good's there. That's a lie from the devil to distort your spirituality. Michelle's name, his original Hebrew name means who is what God is. Like he's, there's an awe, awe of who God is. And to Meshach, which means I'm despised, contemptible and humiliated, which means it's really it's a wounded emotion. By the way, this is what my name was translated to. When I was in junior high, I, I was told all growing up by my parents, you're awesome. Man, in God, what, what God has made you, who is what God is? And then I got bullied. And I'm telling you, my emotions were a wreck inside of my life. And I started living out that name over my heart and doing things I didn't even want to do 
just to try to get somebody around me to like me. And then finally, the name Azariah means Yahweh has helped me. In fact, Yahweh means it's the God who prophesies to your future. It's literally what it means to the servant of Nebo. Now, this one's the hardest to understand until you look up the word Nebo, and the word Nebo means to prophesy. In other words, no, 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 don't, don't follow God's prophecy for your life. Follow the devil's script. He has a new script for you, and it's a redirected purpose. So let me say it this way. A lot of people are now have a name written over their heart, and it's the plan you've chosen for your life or the plan you ended up living for your life that you know wasn't the plan that you were supposed to live for your life. And for some of you, you say, well, PC, it's too late. I'm already living it. I'm already married to them. I've already had this. I've had that. I've done this. I've done that. As if to say, and there's no way out of this destination that I have chosen or I ended up in. To which you would need to know that God has this supernatural ability to turn everything around for the good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. That while, yes, it is a long way from Birmingham to Atlanta when you go through Little Rock, Arkansas. <laughs> but you can still get there from there. And while your life may have taken a turn in a direction that God never intended, the lie that is written on some of your hearts is, yeah, but I'm already way over here. And God says, no, we can still, the last chapter that I've written for your life still fits. Now, I'd love at this point to say, and so just lift your hands and I'll pray for you and you'll immediately be healed right now and your heart will never be the same. And we're gonna, you know, just by the spirit of God, your, that name's gonna be written off your heart. And we're gonna write some new, that's just, I'd love to say that. And from time to time, God does do that, but it's very rare. It's a process. And I'm inviting you into it. I'm inviting you into a process, a journey, that I would love to be the tour guide for. I'm not the answer, but I know who is. And I'd love to take you on this journey to letting God do a work in your heart to the point where you'll say, man, I used to be, this used to make me so mad and it just doesn't anymore. I used to never stop clicking and now it's just like I don't even want that anymore. I used to be the worst communicator and nobody in my family really respected me and now I had the admiration of my whole family. What, what happened? A heart change, a name change, and your identity, and your spirituality, and your wounds, and your future. The, the, the wrong things can be erased and new ones can be written on. Say, PC, how? Well, if you go back to those four names, they all really give you the, the prescription as well. And that we need to do what Daniel really means, and that is I'm going to let the one who Design me, define me. So I'm just going to say God's right, and I'm not. And I'm not going to be a person that's going to live by my emotions and my feelings. I'm going to be a person who lives according to the Word of God. Why? Because God created me. Why would I step away from the manufacturer's instructions when he's the one who made who I am? And that's why the psalmist David says, for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb, which is, by the way, why we are pro-life here at Church of the Highlands, because God had his hand on your life when you were still in your mother's womb. You're not an embryo. You're a person, everybody. You're a person. And I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, and I know it. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. And while I was still in my mother's womb, you put days and a purpose and a plan. They were all written in your book before one of them ever came to be. That God is not something to be afraid of. Number two, if you want to take this heart journey, you need to see God for who he really is. That he loves you. I know for some of you can't believe this because you really never had somebody love you like God does. But he knows what you did last night. He, knew what you, he knows what you thought last night. And his thoughts are still precious when he thinks about you. Are you sure? Oh, yeah. Does he approve? No. He doesn't approve. But he loves you. He's not irritated. He's not frustrated. Because he still sees who you could be.
He doesn't judge you for what you've done. He, he sees you for who you can become. And that'll never change. The third step in the journey, if you're willing to take it, first, I'm going to live according to what God says. He, he, he's my judge. I'm going to see God the right way and thoroughly. I have to allow God to do it. So let me say it this way. God sees how your heart can be healed and how the names can be erased and rewritten, but it'll never happen. Never. Until you say, okay, I'm taking the mask off. Search me, know me. Know my heart, Lord. Look, 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 look. See it? Yeah. And I need you, God, to know my thoughts, know my offensive ways. You have to give God permission. And for most of us, that happens in this small group context where you find out everybody else in there is going through the same thing. And then you can invite God into your future and say, okay, from this day forward, I'm going to live my life for you. All of these are found in Psalm 139. I literally just outlined one portion of scripture. I didn't make these up. This is in God's word. And here's the last verse of Psalm 139. Now lead me in a path of everlasting life. And that's not talking about heaven. That's talking about right now. Would you look at me for a second? Joy, fulfillment, life has a path. <laughs> it's a pathway. And God's inviting you into it. And you'll love who you'll become if you'll allow God to touch your heart. Amen. So God, I, I hope I did, my, I did my best to help us all see that there's stuff there. There's stuff on, in my heart that I've allowed things to be written. But God, today we're, we're taking a step and a journey and a belief and a faith that says, God, you're going to heal us. And I'm asking, Lord God, that you make our hearts enlightened, focused, clear, healed. So God, give people courage as we all take our spiritual steps towards you. Let this be the year, God, where we do live extraordinary lives. Heads bowed, eyes closed. I never close a service, ever. Haven't done it for 22 years without giving people a chance to make a decision for Jesus. So you say, how do I become a Christian? You have to decide. And when you decide, you tell him. And that's why the Bible says, if you'll confess with your mouth, Jesus from this day forward is going to be my Lord. And then you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. He'll save you. Saving you means he forgives all of your sins, past, present, future. He makes a home for you in heaven. And he puts his spirit inside of you to live a completely different life. And if that's what you want, or if that's what you want again because you've walked away from God, campus pastors, come join me then pray this prayer right there where you're seated. Say, Jesus, thank you for dying for my sins. Today, I repent. Say that, I repent. I turn my life around and I'm now gonna follow you. Now say it the way the Bible says it. Be the Lord of my life. I'm gonna live my life for you, your way, because I trust you and I love you. So forgive me, change me. Holy Spirit, come live inside of me and make me the person you've always wanted me to be. You're the son of God who rose from the dead. And today I put my faith in you. In your name I pray, amen and amen. How about a hand clap for everybody who just prayed that prayer?